I want to keep making turnips. I want to keep building out my regiment, which I have called the red cap rotters and show you guys what they look like. And I got a little inspired. Well, when I say inspired, I mean, I got a little upset and then turned that anger into inspiration. And I had a little bit of inspiration for an idea for my TOF, for, for one of the leaders of the red cap rotters. And it came from a not very original design uh, that was showcased not too long ago by Games Workshop. I am a big fan of Nurgles. This is public information. I have a whole playlist full of videos where I make my own cosmic horror Nurgles. I'm just not a fan of a lot of the designs that GW puts out for them, even though I love the lore behind them. I'm also not a fan of how they just reuse the same design like years later with better sculpting and better technology and then charge people a ton of money for the same thing over we're getting off topic uh, i'm going to show you how i made a toff to get things started i'm actually going to steal from another sculpt that i have from Wilhelm miniatures it's this really cool little guy riding around on a snail and i'm going to use some thermoplastic to make a quick push mold of the mouth and the teeth i would normally just saw the head off and use it on my piece but I don't have a saw at the moment. Just remember that for later because we're gonna eventually take the green stuff casting from that mold and attach it to our pound store water buffalo that I have from another project. Digging through my bits of Perry miniatures, I'm looking for any parts that sort of call out to me, anything that looks interesting, anything that I think will match the silhouette the pose that I'm looking for. I'm grabbing an assortment of heads, arms, legs, bodies. Even if I don't think it'll be a perfect match, I'm just gonna grab out everything that I think will work now and keep those to the side so I can start playing around with a dry fit. The torso isn't incredibly important as I'm gonna end up sculpting over most of it later on, but I am taking the time to pin and glue it to the body of the mount because I wanna make sure I have a sturdy base to sculpt on top of later on. The trickiest part for me is finding a pair of legs that sort of comfortably match the shape, the curves of our little buffalo's body. So I'm going to cut the legs a little bit shorter than I normally would, glue them into place, and then later on with my clay, I'll fill in some of the gap. I'm adding on this huge lump of clay to create this bulbous belly for our top. I give him a high collar, which is gonna go around the neck, and then using a leftover piece of string from a tea bag, I wrap that around the belly and super glue it into place just to give us a little bit of a textured detail for the belt that isn't just more clay. I do kind of wish I took the time to add some more detail here, maybe have some roots spilling out where the belly button's supposed to be, but I'll remember that for the next time I do something like this. Moving on, I roll out and cut some clay down to make the shape of a sash or uh, a bandolier of some kind that will wrap around the chest. I need to work in these specific steps so I can build up layers of detail, but without trapping myself and needing to go back to a previous layer. Once I'm happy with all the details for the bandolier and the belt and so on, I roll out a really thin piece of clay, which I carefully drape over the body. You can see that I've already gone ahead and pre-tattered, uh, pre-torn the edges of the coat. You'll also notice that in this stage of smoothing and uh, forming some wrinkles for the coat, I'm switching in between tools quite frequently. Metal tools are typically when I need something to be a bit firmer, where the silicon shaper tools are obviously a bit softer. 
But with the coat out of the way, I can start thinking about the arms for this character. I found a nice set of knight's arms and I'm just pre-drilling the left hand, which is eventually going to hold a weapon in it later on. By adding this hole now rather than later, I can actually take a piece of wire and position it in such a way that I'm happy with the pose and I know roughly what it's going to look like when they're holding on to a weapon. Then with a little bit of clay that I had left over, I'm just giving a sort of like rain flap, back flap, I don't know, a piece of fabric to add some detail to the back of our character and also to cover up some of those unsightly seams where the armor has been pushed into the clay. So for the head of my toff, I wanted to do something uh, a little special. I have this huge set of prawns from the District 9 board game. And one of them is holding a butcher's knife, but also a cow skull, a bovine head. And I always see toffs online. I always see other people's work where they, they're using that, that kind of skull for the character. And I was so happy when I remembered that I had these because there was a brief moment in history where I was trying to figure out how to get an expedited cow skull mailed to me. The head is gonna look awesome on our character and then ha having the little uh, butcher's knife, that was a little extra inspiration for the character. Um, some, some more on that later. But anyway, once I had the head safely extracted from the rest of the miniature, I could then pin and glue it onto our new toff. And from there, it was finally time to do some trial and error on giving this guy a, a pointy cap. Um, it's a little bit more wizard slash garden gnome at the moment. I plan on adding some more details to it later on to make it look sort of more like a Phrygian cap, but the clay is too soft and anything I do will cause it to bend and move. And since there isn't an armature inside, I'm just going to let the clay sit for a little while and use the leftover that I have to make a wooden shield, which I'm going to attach onto the mount. Now you can see I'm using a wooden stir stick to push the detail into the clay. You could just as easily take a wooden stir stick, chop it into pieces and make a shield that way, but I had all this leftover clay and I didn't want it to go to waste. To finish off this first batch of clay that I mixed up, I'm rolling out the last of it now to add on a little saddle for the back of our mount. I know I didn't really put one underneath the toff. We'll just say he hopped onto it and is riding it bareback. And uh, before this creature perished, it had a, a accoutrement of just miscellaneous pieces attached to it before it became reanimated by the root. I'm not looking at any reference for this. I'm just adding on a couple of strips of clay, just long rectangles making an even skinnier and longer rectangle to wrap around the bottom of our water buffalo and attach the two ends like a strap. I'm adding a little bit of detail using some more of that string. I'm taking one of the Perry miniature backpacks and gluing it just behind the toff. Speaking of adding some fun details, I added a cavalry sword to the side of our toff just to fill in that little void of space there that was bugging me on his side. I attached our hand-sculpted wooden shield from earlier, as well as a bit of leftover plastic that looked like a metal shield to the front of the mount. I've also given our butcher a sword and the butcher's cleaver that I mentioned earlier. From there, we needed to hit the final stretch of adding in some details. Firstly, returning back to our pointy cap from earlier, adding in some little panels to the side and a bit of a wider rim around the top. If you remember back to the beginning of the video, we can now pop out the green stuff casting from our mold and then moving on to our butcher's proper cleaver. A little bit of green stuff rolling and cutting, a little bit of drilling with my pin vise to make a perfect hole, and then finally gluing it to a handle and we've got an appropriately sized weapon for our toff. And here's a quick look of where he's at before we move on into making the base. As you can see, I did go back and add in a few details with some tea bag strings and some coffee filter paper, just to get a little bit more texture and variety into the final sculpt. Now, if you could indulge me for just one moment of your time to talk about this video's sponsor, because it's me, I'm the sponsor, 
I'm the master of my own destiny. I have written a book. It is called Dr. Cornelius Carter's Catalog of Countless or Chaotic Commodities. This book is a magical item generator. It has two tables of 100 items, 100 spell effects, which means 10,000 possible combinations for you to make weird, wacky, wonderful, and honestly, worrisome magical items for any fantasy setting. It is agnostic of any role-playing game, and by that very measure, it works in every role-playing game. Some key features about the book. It has 40 pages of beautiful public domain art. I have created 20 items already within the book to get you started and to show you how it works. And it also comes with a license from me to do whatever you want with the book after you purchase it. To put things into perspective, if I may, if I'm able to sell 100 copies, right, of this PDF, that pays for my rent for a month. There are currently two ways to get this book. One is by purchasing it from my itch account using the link down below. The other way is by signing up for my Patreon at the $5 tier. You get the book for half the price and you get to see a ton of bonus content, which you don't normally get to see. And so if you were gonna ask me, I'd say signing up for Patreon is the better end of the deal. And if you listened this far into my rambling at this segment of the video, yes, it even has turnip related content within the book. I love making things, I love making videos about those things, and I love sharing them with you all. So if you're able to, if you could help me out, go check out the book. I promise you, you're going to love it. I worked really, really hard on it, and I'm so incredibly proud of it. To give this character a more heroic looking base, I started off with two MDF squares. Once they were super glued together, I then cut down a strip of cork, which I managed to pick up from my local art store at a discount because it was slightly damaged. So I only ended up paying maybe a pound for this huge sheet, which is going to serve me very well for lots of miniatures to come. I should also mention that while I didn't film it, I used some dried out coffee grounds to add some more texture in between all the gaps and to cover up any of the unsightly seams between the different layers of cork. But the main bonus detail for this base is using a texture stamp that I've made in actually one of my shorts here on YouTube. I created this bumpy fungal looking pattern using a leftover piece of milliput and green stuff and then broke that down into smaller chunks which I could then super glue onto the base. When I paint this up later it's going to give this fungal looking texture to the terrain. Speaking of painting things up, I primed both the base and the miniature with some black spray primer and then hit it with a gray from above, creating a very dark zenithal effect and then working my way from the hooves and up on our mount. I started by doing what I normally do, which is adding in shadows and then coming back and doing highlights, but then by accident, while I was mixing up some colors, I started putting down some coats of paint that were a little bit too wet. They were more like a wash than, than anything. Think of like a thick wash, if you will. But I really liked the blending effect that that had with all the paints. And so I started to do that a little bit more intentionally on the rest of this piece. In fact, the dry brushing that I did on the hair for the mount is the last time I do any dry brushing on this piece. At most, I'll do a very wet overbrush on a couple of areas. But from this point forwards, I'm actually adding in probably 50% more water than you want to be to your paints. And then blending in a lot of the colors as I go through, trying to get things to run and have a natural effect, and then letting them dry on the model. I'm not coming back in with a towel or a paintbrush or anything to dry off the excess paint. The effect I find is a very accidental, a very unintentional oil wash kind of effect. When I look at videos of people working with oil paints, everything is very 
messy, it's kind of chaotic, it's all blending together. And it's created a very cool look that I've tried to continue to replicate on the rest of this piece. I don't think it would be very hard for anyone watching this video to see where I get a lot of my inspiration from when it comes to Turnip 28. A lot of it just comes from the community and looking at what other people are doing. But one piece of unique inspiration, if you will, for this character and for the rest of my red cap rotters comes from my favorite television show of all time, Over the Garden Wall. If you love animation, if you love a compelling story, if you love just absolutely dark, heartbreaking tales that will leave you sitting in the middle of the night wondering what it means to be alive, you will love Over the Garden Wall. And if you've already seen Over the Garden Wall, then you're probably starting to work out who this TOF is based off of. So yes, my friends, I am unfortunately taking this beloved animation and turning it into a corrupted, root-infested Turnip 28 Regiment. And I do have our often fearful hero, Wirt, leading this regiment, astride his semi-faithful companion, Fred the Horse. In the first video about Turnip 28 I ever made, to create a metallic effect, I just opted to use a metallic silver paint, which I never liked, if I'm being perfectly honest. This time around, I'm going for what I call a baby's first attempt at non-metallic metals. Working with varying degrees of gray, getting lighter and lighter and lighter as I get closer to the highlights, I'm creating a metallic effect on each piece of metal, but then coming back and covering everything in rust colors. On the one hand, this is to obviously cover up my poor metal painting, but it also serves a purpose for our story. This character, or this regiment of turnips, to my mind, they are still somewhere out in the unknown, somewhere in a deep swamp, and metal rusts over time, especially for a group of people that quite frankly are not going to be looking after it. Everything that's supposed to look metallic on this character is going to get the exact same treatment. The last thing to paint on our top was the leather bandolier that goes across their chest, which was absolutely the most nerve wracking part of painting because I really, really, really didn't want to have to go back and fix up that white shirt underneath. From here, I can move on to finishing up the base, which isn't anything super special. It's very similar to the terrain video I've made previously on the channel for Turnip 28, with the main change, of course, being those little fungal patches that I added in. The little fungal patches have a very, very dark yellow wash, and then I slowly work up a highlight on each of the individual spores with less and less black added to the yellow paint. And then finally, with a flat brush, I just come in and add some splotches of green all around the base. I'm going to think about this army as a dark fairy tale, as a what if, because there is a moment in Over the Garden Wall where our protagonists are faced with lying down, giving up, and being overtaken by the root. So that is my scratch built toff, uh, greatly inspired by something I love over the garden wall, and loosely inspired by something that fills me with rage. If you enjoyed this video, I have more Turnip 28 content on the channel, and if you want to see some crispy high res PNGs of this build. Check out my Instagram. I have shared some work in progress photos and some final shots that I normally only share to my patrons, but I was really proud of this build and I just wanted to showcase a little bit more of the work that goes on behind the scenes. Please consider subscribing, sharing, liking the video, all the usual YouTubery things. And once again, if I could very sincerely ask for you to check out my book, it is genuinely one of the coolest RPG supplements I have ever produced. Thank you again, as always, to my amazing patrons, my wonderful coven. I literally would not be able to make these videos without your support. I was recently asked by some friends of the channel if I could set up a wish list for people who wanted to support me but couldn't do it on a monthly basis like with Patreon. That is now part of my links below in the description of this video. So everything you need to know in the description just down below. Thank you for watching this video all the way through and until the next one, bye.